welcome to another addictive episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast with your host and sailing addict, David Howes. Hi folks and welcome to episode 5 of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. This week we talked to John Lucas and John, back in 1972, so 44 years ago, sailed a 40 foot long 30 ton houseboat 3,000 miles from Geelong, west of Melbourne, all the way up the east coast to Thursday Island at the bottom of New Guinea. So it's a really, really interesting episode and when you think about the technology, the safety equipment, uh, the information on whether that was available 44 years ago and you think about what we have today, it really is quite an amazing feat, quite an amazing achievement. To put it into perspective, sailing the houseboat uh, 3,000 miles is more than double the distance of crossing the Tasman Sea and would take you most of the way across the Pacific from New Zealand to the USA. So it's a great episode. Uh, I hope you enjoy it and I think you'll find it really interesting. And certainly in the show notes as well online, we've got some images we've captured of the media coverage back in 1972 that was uh, captured by uh, boat and by plane across the news networks, by, across radio stations, newspapers and television. So I think um, you'll find it interesting as well. Some great photos in there of the, of the, of the journey of, the, of, of John and his crew um, and, and a great story. So enjoy. This week we're with uh, John Lucas. Uh, welcome along, John, and thanks for joining us on the Ocean Sailing Podcast. And we've got a unique opportunity this week. We're going to talk to John about his story from from uh, more than four decades ago now about an amazing trip that he made. Uh, so, John, tell us a little bit about w- what was this trip? Where did it start? Um, where did it end? And, and where did the idea come from to start with? Uh, sure, and good morning, uh, David. Um, uh, we call uh, this uh, particular expedition the Daydream Expedition, uh, whereupon we sailed a uh, flat bottom houseboat from Geelong uh, all the way to Thursday Island, uh, taking uh, approximately three months. Uh, the whole issue started when a group of missionaries uh, got together in Geelong and uh, built this houseboat. Uh, after they'd finished the houseboat, they found uh, that they couldn't get it up to uh, New Guinea in any way, shape or form. They'd run out of money by that time. Uh, things weren't going too well. Uh, on a particular day, I came across the guys that had put it together and I said why don't you sail it up and they said well we're not too sure that could be possible because we can't even get it out past Point Henry which is the local uh, signal station in Geelong. Uh, One conversation led to another Uh, a month or so later I was approached and asked if it could really be done and uh, I said well let's give it a try. Uh, So myself Uh, Len Day, uh, who was one of the owners of the boat, and uh, two other people. The three of them had never been to sea in their life before, so they were novice uh, at going uh, on the water. However, Len had flown in the London to Sydney air race, so he was a pilot, not a seaman. So we rigged the boat up. We had um, advised Canberra of what we had in mind, and they sent down something like uh, 26 different departments to try and stop us from doing it. Uh, We had to meet all the regulations, and in the end, there was no reason uh, why we couldn't do it. However, I would say today, it would be impossible that you would not get the permission uh, because of safety at sea. So we uh, set the boat up. It was a flat-bottom houseboat with a draft of uh, 18 inches, uh, two big rudders uh, on the stern. Uh, quite a comfortable boat being a houseboat inside. Uh, we also rigged a mast uh, which carried a uh, cat gaff rig sail and that was for the sake of an auxiliary should it, we have any problems with the motor. Now the motor in particular was a, a, a jet water jet motor that uh, traversed 360 degrees. It was the invention of a local uh, in Geelong who wanted wanted us to give uh, this particular engine a try. So that was installed. It was a 310 horsepower Perkins diesel converted to uh, operate uh, with with the sea and cooling. 
and uh, and we put the crew together and set off. Um, our first trip was down to uh, Swan Bay uh, for the night, where we pulled in. Swan Bay is 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 a very uh, small bay uh, down near Queenscliff, which is uh, the Heads. And uh, the next morning we set off uh, to go out through the Heads. Now the Heads are known as one of the if not the roughest, the second roughest stretch of water in the world, second only to the Cape. So we were very cautious about how we're going to tackle that. Um, so the first, our first episode, of course, getting out of Swan Bay is we what? Ran aground. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <laughs> this was a good start to the trip. However, when we sorted that out, we uh, got in touch with the Point Lonsdale Light, which organises the traffic coming in and out through the heads. And uh, we were given the OK to uh, make our way out. So we put the big engine on, the sails up. Uh, at the same time, uh, there was the start of the uh, Melbourne to Devonport yacht race. And the weather was pretty bad and they actually cancelled the start of that. But uh, we being a little better at sailing decided that we'd take the risk and go out. Not a very smart idea, as we found out halfway through. But having done that, we made it through the rip, and uh, not too uh, long after making it through the rip, our sail tore. So that was the first bit of damage on the boat. Uh, uh, we knew that there was a sail maker close to in at Flinders, so we stripped the sails off, took the sails in, <clears throat> got them repaired. We pulled in at Flinders, of course prepared the sail and prepared to uh, go round uh, Wilson's Prom, which again is, is uh, pretty tricky if you catch it on the wrong day. Uh, it, uh, that's why they call it the second roughest stretch of water in the world. Well, we ended up going around it in a 4.7, which was not very comfortable, but the lucky part for us was it was actually on our stern. Um, so halfway around and a, a number of uh, quick prayers um, we thought we'd be in trouble, but we then found a refuge bay, which is a safe uh, little haven uh, around the point there. So we pulled in there for the night, sat in there comfortably, and the next morning things had quietened down a lot, uh, so we took up uh, along the coast. We uh, then got to uh, our next stop, and uh, we wanted to go in and pick up some stores which was relatively easy to do in a flat bottom houseboat because you don't have much of a draft. Um, I lined up the, the, um, the leads to go in and I advised the crew that they were the leads, that's how we got in. And there was quite an active discussion on board with those that hadn't sailed before who thought that there was an easier and softer and more gentler way to get through the quite big waves that were coming in. Big argument pursued. And um, uh, my comment was, well, your boat, uh, your problem, we'll do it your way, but don't call me if you get into trouble. Well, halfway through, we were in trouble. We were starting to broach and do all sorts of things. And uh, after a torrid time, we uh, finally made it in to a place called Inverloch. At which stage I said, well, Thanks for the invitation to uh, join you in this cruise, but I think under the circumstances, I'm out of here. So it's quite a quite an interesting place to be, given you, you know, power into a pretty long trip, um, to come to that conclusion that quickly. Uh, yes, well, the conclusion was drawn because uh, I had lost the authority to run the boat, <laughs> and uh, as we say in the classics, uh, one ship, one captain. Um, Again, I had had the experience. I've been sailing since I was about eight years old. <clears throat> However, we did we worked through that issue, and uh, Len uh, then said to me, "Well, John, from this day on, you are now one hundred percent in charge. What you say goes." Uh, that's a good idea. That put all the pressure back on me. <laughs> um, we uh, we then we stayed in Inverloch for about two or three days until the weather had changed a little and then we continued our trip up along the coast. Uh, the local newspapers and TV stations were covering uh, the trip and uh, so we had a chat to them about our experiences getting through the rip 
on a flat bottom houseboat, which weren't very comfortable. They were quite surprised that we had made it through. And the local sailors in the area uh, complained and said how crazy we were and uh, that we would have no hope whatsoever of taking this houseboat up to New Guinea. How's it? However, as the day pursued, we, um, and knowing that we'd taken every step for our safety, one of the crew members uh, decided after the rough trip that the first few days that he'd quit, he'd had enough. I think it was either too slow or he was too concerned as to what might happen with this trip. And, and what sort of speeds were you, were you doing, do you think? We were probably doing speeds uh, conservatively around three to five knots. Um, we'd pick that particular time of year because it's the start of the South East Trades. So we pretty much uh, had the wind on our tail most of the way. If we picked up some northerly weather, we really had to pull off and park somewhere until the northerlies had gone because the houseboat had a chisel nose on it, which obviously didn't take too kindly to uh, northerly winds. So what sort of angle could you sail to windward then? Where, how f beyond a reach, how, far, how much further, uh, beyond, further beyond that could you go? Uh, more than likely just on a reach, yeah. You right. couldn't, uh, you certainly wouldn't go into a beat of any sort. Um, but again, because of the sourish prevailings, it was mostly up our tail or, or on a fair sort of a reach, uh, shy reach, or which would carry on to a broad reach if we got a little bit more easterly into it. So we're looking at some of the newspaper cuttings from the time of the trip, and this is before mobile phones existed, and this is before internet existed. So how did you communicate your story and your updates and your progress to the people that were following you in the, on the media side? Okay, well, the government uh, said that we would have to get a radio that was strong enough and that we must radio in every evening to let them know where we were. <coughs> we uh, were doing that, but we weren't getting any response from them. They just weren't there and weren't listening and weren't available. And So uh, whilst we tried every night, uh, we pretty much didn't uh, get anywhere near them. Um, but we had uh, Phillips uh, heard of our trip and they decided to sponsor us with a big radio. So they gave us uh, the radio, uh, which, which uh, helped us immensely through the trip and we could keep in touch with um, the people back home. We made it up to, um, to uh, Ballina. Uh, well, we made it around the Cape and, and up to, up to uh, Ballina, which is... Uh, well, Ballina, I'll just go back on that. We're actually back in Sydney, Ballina. I'm reading ahead of myself here. Ballina's a little bit further on. <clears throat> well, we made it into Sydney and we pulled into the Cruising uh, Yacht Club of Australia who welcomed us and uh, gave us a free berth for as long as we wanted to stay there. At that particular stage, of course, all the uh, TV stations and uh, the newspapers were starting to catch up with us and finding out where we were, what we'd been through and how we were handling the whole situation. So we stayed in Sydney probably for about four or five days. And uh, when the weather cleared a little bit, uh, we again took off through Sydney Heads and, and headed up to, uh, towards Port Macquarie. Uh, that part of the trip was reasonably comfortable and it wasn't uh, uh, we, until we got near Coffs Harbour that the, the wind picked up somewhat considerably and we were fighting... Uh, 25 to 30 knot uh, breezes. Uh, there were big ships that were passing us by that were burying their bow and, and the spray was probably reaching uh, uh, 30, 40 foot up in the air which um, made us look very small in comparison and of course made us uh, think twice about what we were doing. So just, just, to, just to touch on a couple of things, so how long was this vessel and how wide was it? Uh, it was 40 foot long if we go back to feet and inches, <laughs> uh, had an 18 foot draft and um, an 18 inch. Uh, uh, sorry, an 18, uh, <laughs> 18 inch kill. draft. Now, one of the problems we had with the water jet unit um, 
which traversed 360 degrees, was okay, but we found that we couldn't get a lot of steerage out of the boat. So we had to put two big rudders on, one on each uh, of the stern quarters, which helped us immensely to, uh, to turn the boat or to control the boat. So that made it a lot easier. We uh, got up to Coffs Harbour uh, and the weather had certainly turned nasty. Uh, but we were doing reasonably well. We didn't have a, a lot of problems. And we'd put quite a few miles behind us. After leaving Coffs, the next stop uh, would have been Ballina. And we were fighting some pretty big seas by that stage. Um, but we were running a bit short on fuel and running short on food, um, what have you. So we decided we should put in the Ballina. So we hove to, uh, pulled the sail down, kicked the big motor over, lined up the bar and uh, boy did we shoot in that bar. We got in and pulled up at uh, Ballina and um, this old fella came down, big beard, smoking a pipe, dirty old jacket on, said, who's in charge of this craft? <laughs> um, not being in the best frame of mind at that particular time, I said to him, who wants to know? And he said, I do. He said, I'm the harbour master. I said, oh, that's great. He said, well, I've never seen anything like that in my life. He said, I saw you coming up the coast. He said, our bar has been closed for five days. I was out doing the garden and I saw you heave to and thought, well, you're going to run for cover down round the point. Next thing I looked up and you were lining up the bar. And I thought, well, I better get to the garage and grab the port's close signs and run them up the masthead, which I did. The only problem was when I got them to the masthead, they had no cleats on them. He said, by this stage, he said, you had started coming over the bar and I just stood back in sheer amazement and couldn't believe what I was seeing as uh, you came through. Uh, well done. My comment to him was, quite frankly, if you'd got those signs up, we wouldn't have known what they meant anyway and we were coming in. <laughs> so that was uh, quite a bit of a challenge. Well, and quite a quite a compliment away from a harbour master who sees all sorts of things happen. And and the, to put in context, the east coast of Australia, the, the sandbars most of the way up and down the coast are pretty t treacherous, and they they change and move around a lot. And and lots of them aren't suitable most of the time. Um, in, in the conditions that that we have. Sure. Well, going back in the early days, of course, uh, they've gone a long way lately to making a lot of the bars a lot safer than they, than they used to be. And to put this in context. What, when are we talking about here? What what year was this? We're talking about um, 1972. So 44 years ago, <laughs> so just to put this in context. And so 44 years ago, um, most of the only boats that generally used the bars were the fishing boats that knew the waters very well and, um, and spoke with the harbour master before they came in and out. Okay, and in terms of the, the trip, John, so... What is the total distance from Geelong to Thursday Island? Uh, over 3,000 miles. So that's, uh, when you think about that and you put that in the context, that's more than crossing the Tasman Sea twice. Uh, and, and it'll get you a fair, way to, a fair way towards South America if you were to sail across the ocean towards South America. It, it most certainly would. Mm. Okay, and how old were you at the time? Uh, I was 27 at the time. Okay. So that might give you an indication as to how old I am now, but <laughs> how many sea miles I've done. Um, and and <coughs> with the trip, how many people did you do the trip with? Well, it started off uh, four of us, and as I said, one of them got off. But when we pulled in at Inverloch, uh, we went to the local hotel uh, to have a, a bar meal and a quick drink. We had a little to drink on board, but went to the bar to have a quick drink. We were talking to uh, one of the young farmers there and he said, well, what are, where are you guys from and what are you doing? And we said, well, we have this flat bottom houseboat and we're trying to uh, take it all the way to New Guinea. He said, do you, do you need help? And we said, um, yeah, actually we're one short in the crew. 
Uh, well, within the next half an hour, he'd been home, packed his bags, and he was on the boat. <laughs> Quickly. And he had had a bit of experience. So he had worked on trawlers and what have you uh, over the years, when, in between his farming, when he was cropping and what have you. But uh, he was very keen, jumped on board, and was a great help, of course. So you, so you made it out successfully out over the bar again, and you left Ballander, and, and what happened next? Okay, our, uh, our next uh, big bar to cross was, of course, the, um, the uh, bar at Surface Paradise, which was notorious in those days. Um, most of the fishing boats that came out through there used to have to run up the coast, find the channel and run back down. Uh, we had different things in mind because we knew we had a shallow draft and uh, we heaved the boat straight through. Now, it was a pretty rough day, and uh, those uh, that were at the local hotel all come roaring out uh, and thought that they were going to see uh, the greatest uh, demise of a boat that ever come through or across that bar. Uh, when we got in, of course, there were great cheers, and uh, many of them came down to the boat, brought a lot of alcohol with them, congratulated us, and, and sat down and had a chat to, uh, all day, all night, about what we'd been doing, uh, how we'd got to that stage, and uh, what our next uh, big trip was to be. Great, classic, classic Gold Coast welcome. So then you stopped in the Gold Coast, and how long were you here for? So after the Gold Coast, and we were in the Gold Coast for about five days, again uh, waiting for a bit of a break in the weather. Uh, however, we uh, knew that there was an inside passage, so we used the inside passage to uh, go up to Moreton Bay and um, out through Moreton Bay uh, to continue our journey. Uh, our, uh, next, um, our next big uh, problem was uh, getting around uh, Double Island Point. Once again, uh, the weather was very, very heavy. Uh, the bar had been closed. Uh, for a week or so and so we were stuck out there we couldn't go in uh, so we had to find somewhere to hide which we did just around the corner of, of Double Island Point uh, there's a little lagoon so we uh, carefully placed it out to make sure we could get in uh, we popped in there and had to sit in there for about four or five days before they reopened the bar now we were in constant contact uh, with them and uh, the first uh, prawn trawler that came out when they reopened the bar uh, hit the sandbar and disappeared completely. Gosh, so it so sank. It's, it sank and um, there were no signs of it or any of the gear. And as you would know, most fishing boats carry a lot of um, flotation gear. None of that was ever found. So what we assume happened was uh, they were coming out, sitting on the top of the wave. Uh, it dried out underneath them. The bow dropped off the wave, hit the bottom. The sand uh, in completely encompassed the boat and uh, nothing was ever seen of them again. Uh, we uh, were called in to help um, to see if we could find them because the weather had settled quite a bit by then. So we travelled up and down the coast uh, whilst uh, the um, Coast Guard uh, also went out looking for them. But uh, they were never seen and no parts of the boat were ever found again. Well, it puts the challenge and challenges and dangers of uh, crossing bars into context when you hear a story like that. Yes, most certainly. I think we all learn uh, when we go sailing that the first thing to do when you're crossing a bar is to try and get some local knowledge from somewhere because the bars do shift. Uh, there's quite a bit of shifting sand. Uh, they can be in one place one day and different place the next. So uh, local knowledge is certainly very, very important. Okay. Um, so what happened next? Uh, from there, of course, was Inland Passage, which was uh, lovely, of course, going inside Fraser Island coming out at the top uh, by that stage of course you're basically inside the Great Barrier Reef so you've got rid of a lot of the big swells that come up from down south and travelling was a lot more comfortable by that stage 
um, we made a couple of stops to pick up fuel and then made our way up to uh, uh, to Hamilton Island where we were warmly welcomed and uh, then uh, up to the group of islands there. Now, a lot of the people on the island had heard that we were coming up. Uh, they uh, met us when we got in. Um, we had some very wealthy businessmen approach us and ask us if we needed anything. And we really didn't, but they said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to let you order as much steak and as much food as you can carry and as much fuel as you can carry, and we're even going to organise some paint for you if you want to paint the boat when you get up there. So we loaded up with all these things, um, uh, thanking them very much that they were quite uh, interested in the trip that we had taken and talking about it and what sort of problems we'd had and where we were going to, going to go from here. So that was very helpful. That's a generous offer and uh, any crew will never turn down a, a good feed or a good meal after you have a long trip. Uh, so it's great, great, um, great to be able to stock up like that. Well, by that time, the idea of having a steak was very good. <laughs> But we had good cooking facilities on board. Um, surprisingly enough, uh, many would ask us how the boat was travelling. And um, uh, when it rode a wave, it was very much like a surfboard. So it went up basically level and, and then sunk down basically level. So you could take on a big sea, a uh, two metre sea or a three metre sea, and uh, ride the wave out quite nicely with the salt and pepper still on the table. Wow, and it's and mm. 40 foot long. And, and what was the what was the beam of the boat? Can't quite recall the beam. But it's pretty. Looking at the pictures, it's, pretty, it's a pretty, beamy. Pretty, pretty beamy boat, right? Yep, yep. So at least probably at least 15 feet, maybe wide. Yes. So yeah, it's 16, 18 foot wide. Yep. Okay. Okay. So what happened next? So we then uh, left there, which was absolutely lovely, of course, going up uh, to uh, Rockhampton, Mackay. As I say, once again, we were, we were in uh, calm seas by that stage, so the motor was running pretty much all the time. Not a lot of breeze. The breeze had dropped out. So we were looking forward uh, to doing the last laps as we uh, went up past Rockhampton, uh, Mackay, following the passage up through there, Townsville, Cairns. Um, had a, an engine problem in Cairns and had to call in and call back home for new parts to replace uh, the engine, keep the engine going. So we did find the, that the sail we'd set up uh, came in very handy uh, quite often through the trip. But in this particular stage, it was all we had. So it did help us a fair bit of the way. So we're uh, pretty well uh, up at Cairns by now. <coughs> and uh, heading inside the Great Barrier Reef, which was quite pleasant, a lot of whales. Uh, we made it up to the very tip of Australia and right up the very tip of Australia there's a little channel that you go through and there's a Japanese pearling company. Now, that pearling company had been there for 50 odd years or so, which was uh, quite interesting because, you know, we'd had a war with Japan, and uh, but the Japanese were up there pearling. Uh, we were invited into the pearl farms, uh, fed up very well, uh, drank some nice Japanese wine and they presented us with some, uh, some of the pearls, uh, in particular some black pearls, which are quite expensive. Uh, they were uh, very happy to see someone come in and come in and have a chat to them, pull in, what have you. So we stayed there for a couple of days before we started to uh, make our way over to Thursday Island. A pretty unique opportunity that you probably never would have imagined possible, especially with the cultural differences maybe even then given the wasn't that long after the war really 25 30 years yes not not long after which was quite surprising when we got up there we were met by um, 
the US Navy, who then advised us, unbeknownst to us, that they had basically uh, been covering us on our trip all the way up with their technical gear, <laughs> which would have been, we would have been happy to know, of course. Um, but they had us on board, uh, gave us a lovely meal, uh, presented us with a United States Navy officer's ring and made the comment that our trip sounded more exciting than the Ra and Kentucky expeditions put together. Because one thing you don't normally do is put to sea in a, a flat-bottom houseboat. That's a really nice the nice touch and what a, what a nice way to recognise the, the, the trip you're undertaking given, given by this stage you're probably 90% of your way through the trip and... And then the final stages. Yes, so the uh, final stages, the trip from Australia across uh, to the islands was very rewarding, very comfortable. Big seas had gone. We were glad to get in and looking forward to booking our flight to get back home, having been away for two days shy of three months. Okay, so, and then the, the arrival at Thursday Island, describe, describe what, how that unfolded. Well, we arrived at Thursday Island, which is a um, regarded as the first port of call into New Guinea. So they have uh, all the the customs there. They have a customs hall. Uh, we had the customs officer come down and meet us. We had to fill out the official uh, customs forms uh, f for getting in there. Uh, but we were made quite welcome. There were not a lot of uh, Anglo-Saxons actually made it up that way, so they were quite happy to see us. Um, we did our official bit and our official paperwork. Uh, we booked our flight and um, spoke with the missionaries over in New Guinea who were to come over, pick the boat up and uh, take it up to the Fly River. And um, did you ever did you ever follow the history of that boat after that? Is it in terms of where it ended up, and is it still? I've no idea where it ended up um, after having spent three months on it, uh, which is probably two days short of what we should have spent. Um, it was constantly used. The Fly River is one of the largest navigable waterways in the world. Uh, we. We certainly had very little to do with the boat once it got there, but the missionaries did use it to uh, travel up and down the river. And because of the 360-degree uh, traversing water jet, it was quite comfortable on the, on the river runs. Okay, and so when you think back now about the construction of the boat and the condition of it when you stepped on board and then the state it was in by the end of the trip, how, how, how was it? Was it fit for purpose or did you have uh, did you have challenges along the way with things breaking and wearing out and coming apart? and no, the boat uh, held up extremely well. Uh, we, the only uh, damage we really sustained, apart from problems, a few problems with the motors and the sails, we actually took a big um, brass, huge brass bell that we were going to give to the missionaries. We had that parked on the bow, and uh, when we came over the bell in the bar. Um, with a fair bit of water smashing across there, we lost the bell. Right. So, so I've, no doubt the, I've no doubt the bell is still down the bottom of, uh, of uh, the bell in a bar. But the boat was in good condition uh, uh, when we handed it over. And what was it constructed out of? It had a um, steel hull on it, uh, uh, built very much like a barge. So it had a chisel nose on it, and of course the upper deck was uh, in sea ply. We um, put two uh, X aircraft seats on the back so that we'd be comfortable sitting on the wheel. We ran shifts, of course, uh, as we went up there. It was sort of four on and eight off as we swung uh, two people looking after the craft when the others were asleep. But uh, it was much appreciated when it got up there. Okay, and what were the... What were the berths like in terms of sleeping? Did you get a good night's sleep? Um. Uh, yes, it was always a good night's sleep because uh, it had uh, four cabins and each cabin um, had two bunks in it and they were very comfortable bunks. And all in all, from the point of view of, of those that do sail and sail 
mono hulls where you're on a slant most of the time, we're on a flat surface and can get actually get a good night's sleep. Yeah, when you think about that, that changes things a lot, doesn't it? When you yes. have a flat, but this is flat <laughs> almost all the time, other than when you're surfing. Well, I probably even surf flat too, I guess, from what you said. Um, what about your what about managing provisions and cooking and refrigeration? Did you have, did you have for refrigeration? And, and yes, we had refrigeration. Um, but once again, because of the shallow draft, we could get in wherever we needed to get in to pick up fuel and uh, to pick up fresh goods, bread and milk. Um, the lunch was normally two slices of bread with some sliced cheese in it and a raw tomato. Uh, the idea of losing a lot of weight on the trip certainly came true. I think I dropped about two stone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and... Um what, did you have much success with fishing along the way? We uh, did. We had a line in from time to time, never caught much. However, when we got up near Cairns and Townsville, there were a lot of Spanish mackerel around. Now, Spanish mackerel are a very good fighting fish and you really don't have to use bait. You can actually put a coloured ribbon on your hook and throw it in and they'll snap at anything. So we, uh, we uh, had uh, a lot of Spanish mackerel to eat. Uh, plus, from time to time, we would run into prawn trawlers and uh, we would offer to buy some prawns off them. But being the uh, good fellows they are and being boaties, all boaties are good friends, uh, they would give us uh, bags and bags of prawns, which, uh, which everyone would enjoy, of course, and, and did not want to charge us anything. Okay, and um, so if you think about the, the, the people, you know, it's a three-month trip, you know, it's a, it's a long trip. Um, after that initial incident coming over the bar, we had almost a bit, a bit of a mutiny going on. Did, ha, how did people get along? Did you, have, did you have people that all got along well? Did you have personality clashes at times? Did you have uh, things that became large thorns in, in your heel by the end of the trip? Uh, yes, there were those times, uh, and that's because you're living in close quarters, uh, of course. So there was a uh, small breakdown between uh, the crew and um, the skipper and uh, the skipper and the owner were sort of 50% of the, the road and the crew were the other 50%. So there were times when we had to call everyone into a meeting and say, look, you know, if you're going to let anyone down, you're going to let the team down if you don't uh, participate and uh, do what we expect of you. But they all came around. There were no big blues or arguments. There was just some grumpy little incidents that uh, that came up over the trip. Which is pretty natural, pretty three natural, months together, yeah. sp- space like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you talked about the, the, the multitude of government agencies involved in getting mm-hmm. approvals to do the trip. What what did you have to do you know, back then in terms of safety equipment and what, what, was, the, what was the plan if it turned to custard? <coughs> Well, um, as I say, they sent... At that particular time, uh, just prior to that, all the states used to look after their own coastline. And uh, uh, six months before, or three or six months before we did the trip, what the government did was uh, they put them all into Canberra. So that then became the centre, so you had to go through Canberra. I think Canberra were all uh, interested in coming down and having a look at checking out our safety. Um, so we had to rig the boat with a lot of safety gear, uh, up-to-date jackets, radios, flares, um, charts, um, and uh, anything else you can think of that might be in our safety. As I say today, they, you, you, would not, you would not be allowed to uh, do something like this. You just would not be able to meet the safety standards. Okay, and you know, when you think about the trip, did you have any really hairy moments or or or, or times when you actually wondered if you're gonna you're gonna get through? Uh, yes, hairy moments, probably uh, three months. Uh, no, not quite. Uh, uh, going out through the rip is uh, always a testing time. Uh, there were 19 commandos uh, back then who 
had uh, to paddle across the front of the rip and uh, they were all lost. They all drowned and they were commandos. Um, wow. There was the pilot boats and pilot boats are a very, very safe boat. They close lock up all the hatches. If they roll over, they pretty much come back up the other way. However, uh, two boats uh, had been lost at sea going out through the rip. It is a pretty treacherous uh, passage of water. It's one that the Sydney Hobart yachts don't look forward to when they're coming across there because you've got all that big water coming across from the west. You've got all that run down the southeast coast. You've got that uh, big winds and seas coming up from the south and it all meets there and it can be flat calm at one instance and uh, really bubbling at the next. Uh, Wilson's Prom was, was obviously a more than a challenge. Uh, at one stage, I certainly believed that we were in trouble until we came upon uh, Refuge Cove. Um, but a lot of the yachties uh, know where Refuge Cove is and a lot of them do uh, use that as a safety mooring overnight. Um, the bars up along the coast were obviously very challenging. Uh, back in those days, once again, you didn't have the advice that you have today. We did, um, it was one of the first books that Alan Lucas, uh, no relation of mine by the way, actually wrote and we were using that as the Bible as we went up. Uh, found that very, very informative and very, very helpful. Uh, but certainly the bars uh, created, many of the bars created a lot of problems. But once again, as once we got inside Fraser Island and um, up past the Whit, Whit Sundays, it was just magic. It's probably some of the best sailing I've uh, done in the world. Okay, and it's interesting that you know the trips more than forty years ago, but you've got you've got really vivid memories mm. of quite a lot of the detail of the trip. It must have had quite a big impact on on your life, obviously at that point. But what what have you done? What have you done since? Or what did, what did you do next? following something like that it must be must have almost been a challenge to go back to a day job and, and, and a regular sort of nine to five life well fortunately for me i was uh, in show business uh, back then and we would probably only bring one or two shows i was elton john's australian tour manager did shows like the bgs susie quattro and what have you so i would uh probably only two two big shows a year so i did have a lot of time to go and do silly things like this. Mm -hmm. But uh, I started at Royal Geelong Yacht Club at the age of eight in Yachting World Cadet Dinghies. And uh, I was the youngest member of Royal Geelong to have a quick cat catamaran, which was designed by Charlie Cunningham. It was a single-handed boat. I was certainly too uh, small and too young to handle it. So that was quite a challenge. And I've had several boats uh, since then. Okay, and have you done much in the way of um, offshore passages or have you been mostly mostly coastal cruising or have you done a bit of racing? What you, uh, what's, your, what's your sailing been around? I've done a, done a bit of everything. I spent a bit of time over around the Isle of Wight. Uh, lived on the Greek islands for about three months. Done a lot of sailing around the Greek islands. Um, lived in the south of France for about six months. Done a lot of sailing around the south of France. So I spent a lot of time on the water uh, uh, doing uh, racing and cruising. Hmm. Okay, that's great. And what what else would you like to tell me about the 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 trip or your experience um, that I haven't asked you about? Uh, well, as I say, the newspapers and um, the TV stations covered the trip pretty extensively, and so I have a uh, good record of the trip. And my son was uh, looking over the record only a few years back, and he said to me, "Dad," he said. If I wanted to do something like that, he said, would you let me? And I said, no bloody way, son. <laughs> <laughs> and what did your parents think of it at the time? Uh, uh, they were all uh, my parents and uh, my girlfriend who I finally uh, married and have been married to for over 42 years. Um, all had a trying time waiting because it wasn't all that often that they heard from us uh, and they picked up most of their information from the newspapers so they didn't know where we were or what was going on. So they were, they, the family uh, were very apprehensive. 
it was pretty natural because it's not that's not a common voyage that somebody does let alone in a houseboat it's not really that's not really made for that kind of thing I guess uh, but it shows you what's possible if it's well constructed and you've got capable people on board yeah we do think all things are possible and I think sailing comes down to uh, riding a bike and driving a car and as much as uh, you're on the side of caution and um and and you just take everything as it comes and and you work through the issues but uh, homework again is is probably one of the most important things um understanding the crew is certainly another one and the crew's requirements so it's all a fair sort of a challenge but uh, something like this was a once in a lifetime opportunity something that no one else has ever done and no one else probably <laughs> silly enough to ever do it again. Be allowed to, uh, uh, let alone be allowed to. Yes, so. but it was an exciting voyage. It's um, it's a it's a great it's a great story, and I really appreciate you taking the time to share it with us today, mm-hmm. so that people can listen and and understand and and you know learn about a story that they would probably not be aware of. Um, particularly given this is this predates when even media content was online. Mm-hmm. And so certainly what I'd like to do is um, scan or photograph some of the, the material you've got here and sure. post that online because it'll allow anybody listening to this to then go on online to the, the notes. Yes, I'm sure they'd appreciate and, uh, and see, look, look seeing at, what the boat looked like. Yeah, that's right. Visually, it bring, brings it to life. And, and when you look at it, um, you know, it puts it into context. It's quite, um, it's quite staggering. And, and, and the mast, relative to the size of the boat, it's not a big mast. So, you know, clearly it's a... You know, it's not going to be moving at a great, great pace. But with just with that, how much of the time were you motoring, and, and how did you how did you manage fuel fuel requirements and ca- carrying enough fuel? Uh, look, we were probably motoring most of the time, but once again, uh, because it had a shallow draft, we could get in and out when we needed the fuel. So um, that's great. Well, thank you for appearing on the Ocean Sailing Podcast this week, and uh, look forward to being able to share your story with everybody. You're welcome, Dave. Uh, we're about to head out on the water and do some quiet racing. We are. So it's a good day. I'll leave this with you if you like, and you can return it when you're finished. You that, that would be excellent. Take some of the photos. Uh. So that would be excellent so I can scan them without the, yep. the right light. And, yep, yep. Um, well, that's, um, that's excellent, John. I really appreciate you putting the time aside, and, and we'll capture capture this and post online, and, yeah, and sure. it'd be really yeah. good to share it. It's really a fascinating story, and I was amazed when you first told me about the story maybe sometime maybe about a year ago now you mentioned it to me I just thought what a fascinating story so I do mention it from time to time and uh, the local papers back home have a history of it of course and they're always asking you about it but other than that I basically haven't done much with it I've been asked on a number of occasions to do a book on it I'm not a bookie person so I wonder whether that'll ever get done <laughs> well, it's a lot easier to talk than to write so um, well, that's great. Well, thank you for appearing on the Ocean Sailing Podcast this week and uh, look forward to being able to share your story with everybody. You're welcome, Dave. And uh, we're about to head out on the water and do some twilight racing. We are. So it looks like a good day. I'll leave this with you if you like and you can return it when you're finished. You can that, that would be excellent. Take some of the photos. Uh. Actually, that would be excellent because then I can scan them without the, and get the right light on them. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Ocean Sailing Podcast. Email your comments and suggestions to oceansailingpodcast at gmail.com. People walking to me and say I'm sorry. I want to look back. I want to talk to them. Sometimes I wonder how they've lived a life like this before Some are just so damn young So turn around and hear them speak So turn around and help them out Turn around cause you're watching them cry And watching some getting ready to die then knocked down to the ground and can't get back up feelings are sad i want to be mad days here are like precious 
Watching some getting ready to 